No, we'll just get started. Okay, because though I always say that this is a short lesson, I, that always means I go 15 minutes over, so we really must begin. Those God has it, well, I, only, I may only have three paragraphs, but I'll make it seem like eight. Those God has accepted in the Beloved, effectually called and sanctified by His Spirit, and given the precious faith of His elect, can neither totally nor finally fall from a state of grace. They will certainly persevere in grace to the end and be eternally saved, because the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. Therefore, He still brings about and nourishes in them faith, repentance, love, joy, hope, and all the graces of the Spirit that lead to immortality. Even though many storms and floods arise and beat against them, yet those things will never be able to move the elect from the foundation and rock to which they are anchored by faith. The felt sight of the light and the love of God may be clouded and obscured from time from them for a time through their unbelief and the temptations of Satan. Yet God is still the same. They will certainly be kept by the power of God for salvation, where they will enjoy their purchased possession. For they are engraved on the palms of his hands, and their names have been written in the book of life from all eternity. As I said before, this is a very comforting uh, chapter, this one and the next, which there is a great amount of overlap. So you may have questions about uh, how do I know that I'm really a saint uh, and I will be preserved or I will persevere? Those are all questions for next week, which is on the topic of assurance of grace, assurance of salvation. So if you have any questions like that, you can ask them now if you'd like, but we will address them in full next week. Uh, but let us begin here. I have listed paragraph one in your notes, the extent of perseverance. And I use the phrase extent because it is important for us to know how far this perseverance goes, that being all the way. It goes to the end. That we do not persevere only for a time. And I will use interchangeably the words persevere and preserve because our confession in the original text kind of uses them interchangeably. That from our end, we are persevering but from God's end, he is preserving us. So I will use those phrases interchangeably. But that God does preserve us to the end. All the way to the end. That we must eventually be saved. And the text of our confession speaks very importantly at the very beginning. Those God has accepted in the beloved. Okay, he is laying out the object those people that will be preserved are only those who are accepted in the Beloved. We must eventually be saved because we are accepted in the Beloved. We'll be looking at this a little bit later, but uh, if you want to kind of put a ribbon uh, or open up a tab for uh, John chapter 17, we'll be spending some time there in a little while. But John chapter 17 is a very wonderful section of Scripture. Uh, if you are an astute listener of my teaching, you know that it's one of my most referenced chapters. I adore John chapter 17, not only for the reason that the Lord prays for us in it, how great a joy to know that the Lord Christ, as our high priest, not only intercedes for us now, but in his time on the earth, prayed for us. I pray not only for those who are with me now, but for those who will be with me from the teachings of those who are with me now, which is us. Those of us who will read the Bible and become Christians, he prays for us. A beautiful thing. But that we are accepted in the beloved. We are given to Christ. Again, that imagery which I've drawn on the chart a number of times on the whiteboard of the economy of the Trinity, the economy of salvation, that the Father gives a people to the Son as a love gift. He, gr he grants them over. We are in the beloved. And because of that, we are ultimately preserved. And also, because of that, we receive blessings from God. That we receive blessings from God. Therefore, he still brings about and nourishes in them faith, repentance, love, joy, hope, and all the graces of the Spirit that lead to immortality. We always receive them and we will ultimately, ultimately receive the final blessing, which is glorification, 
as we persevere to the end, as we are preserved to the end, because we are accepted in the Beloved. It's important that our confession labors that point and makes that point, not only as we've gone through these chapters and we've looked at the work of Christ, we've looked at Christ as our mediator, all of these things, but now as we are continuing down the chain, the golden chain of salvation, as uh, Brother Aiden and I have referenced many times in these uh, previous chapters, we are reminded again, even our perseverance is not because of our actions, but because we are in the Beloved. We are in Christ. And now we'll look uh, at the middle of our confession, the storms. Even though many storms and floods arise and beat against them, yet these things will never be able to move the elect from the foundation and rock to which they are anchored by faith. And we read in the next sentence, the felt sight of the light and love of God may be clouded and obscured from them for a time through their unbelief and the temptations of Satan. Uh, some number of months ago in uh, October, Brother Aiden and uh, Pastor Hotchkiss and I, along with one of uh, our dear friends, Sean Carr, we went to uh, North Carolina for a week. And it was a beautiful experience. And I experienced something which I'd never experienced. I experienced a real sunrise. Which you, you, might, you may think, you know, Braden, you live in Florida. It's, we're like the place of sunrises. And that is true, in a sense. But to experience the sun creeping over a mountain where it is completely pitch black at 5 o'clock, 5.30 in the morning and freezing, freezing cold in the morning. And then the sun carefully creeps up. We know it's there. We know we'll experience it. But we are feeling none of it. But as it slowly breaks over the mountain, and Brother Aiden can attest to it, as the beams of light would hit you, that part of your body would become warm. Because though it was there, and we knew it was there, we saw it coming, we knew it was going to be there, we could not feel it at all. It was like there was no sun. But then as it cracks over it, even when it was cloudy, we could still feel an immediate warmth. And that's the image that I have when I read this second sentence. The felt sight of the light and the love of God may be clouded and obscured. We know it's there. We're certain of it but we feel none of its benefits. I know the sun was there, but my body being 38 degrees was telling me there is no such thing as a sun. There is no warmth. There is nothing. But as soon as it broke through, it broke through the clouds, it broke over the mountain, we were able, we were able to feel it. That it's obscured for a time through their unbelief. Through their unbelief and the temptations of Satan. But I want to focus more on through their unbelief. Because, yes, the temptations of Satan are there. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. Verses 1 through 3 define those three great adversaries of the Christian. The world, the flesh, and the devil. But verse 3 tells us, Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. That of the three enemies which the Christian has, the world, the flesh, and the devil, the flesh is the most difficult one. What was that address? Uh, Ephesians 2, 3, uh, verses 1 and 2. Before that one are where he, he also speaks of uh, the, flesh, or the, the world and the devil. But in verse 3 of Ephesians 2, that's where he, he focuses on the flesh. Paul does. And then Paul spends like all of Romans chapter 7 on this idea as well. That through our unbelief, through our inability in our flesh to love God as we should, to have faith like we should, that can cloud the felt sight of the light and love of God. I mean, Romans 7, time and time again, we see in uh, theology class, we call them called the doo-doo chapter. Not because it's no good, but because Paul is saying, I want to do this, I, but I do this. I don't do this, but I want to do it. Do, 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 do. I do the things I don't want to do. I, I don't do the things I do want to do. All these things. That is Paul's struggling with the flesh. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, 
because, uh, you know, Brother Aiden, I know, has belabored uh, the point in the last uh, number of weeks, so uh, we won't, there's no, nece- there's no uh, necessity for us to continue it, but that is, that is important for us to see. And then, of course, I have a, a quote here, not from Charles Spurgeon, though I have, I have those later. Uh, this is from J.C. Ryle. He says, Let us not forget that our chief danger is from within. The world and the devil combined cannot do us as much harm as our own hearts will if we do not watch and pray. So we see this. We are told that storms and floods arise. Also, our confession uses a a sense of certainty. The confession doesn't say, maybe if a storm or a flood arises and it batters the Christian. No, it says it, it will. Even though many storms and floods arise and beat against them. Certainty. There. We're told that this is a truth, that this will happen, and that the lion's share of the blame for that is laid at our feet. We are encouraged. Yet God is still the same. They will certainly be kept by the power of God for salvation, where they will enjoy their purchased possession. What we learn here is that God changes not, and we remain blood-bought people. And here we go to John 17. John 17, 6. I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. I mean, this is, this is a wonderful truth. Again, that we are in the Beloved. That we are blood-bought people. This is moments, mere hours, before the Lord Christ is crucified. Knowing what was in store. John 18 opens with His being betrayed and beginning that horrible affair. Did you say John 17, 6? Yes, ma'am. John 17, 6. But here we see that as he's praying, he's praying for those whom have been given to him. To be owned by Christ is to be free. And to know that Christ cannot lose those who have been given to him. If he did lose any of them, that would be a loss, obviously. And uh, the Lord Christ does not take L's, as the kids say. He does not. He collects in vast quantity only W's. Extremely common, Lord Christ W. And then we have Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. I mean, that's also a very encouraging thought. That even when we do, by our own failures and our own flesh, through our unbelief, fall into sins, God does not smite us with a lightning bolt or blow us up or cause us to just not exist anymore because He doesn't change, because His promises remain. And I love this line, where they will enjoy their purchased possession. Over and over again, the New Testament writers speak of an inheritance which is ours. That inheritance being Christ and all the blessings which come with Him. Something which we cannot lose, something which cannot be stolen from us, which we, though, as often as we may try to lose our salvation, we we cannot praise Christ. And then the final sentence of this first paragraph, for they are engraved on the palms of His hands, and their names have been written in the book of life from all eternity. Amen. Let us move to paragraph two. Does anyone have a question before I move on? Nope. We're standing on the screen. My PowerPoints aren't as good as Aiden's. That's true. Though, hey, I got some. I got. I got, I got some graphs. I got some graphs, and I got some charts later. So, well, that's exciting. not to brag, but <laughs> this perseverance of the saints does not depend on their own free will, but on the unchangeableness of the decree of election, which flows from the free and unchangeable love of God, the Father. It is based on the efficacy of the merit and intercession of Christ of Jesus Christ and union with Him, 
the oath of God, the abiding of a spirit, the seed of God within them, and the nature of the covenant of grace. The certainty and infallibility of their perseverance is based on all these things. If you have your confession, would you turn to chapter 3? If you don't, I have it there. Boom. Okay. Chapter 3, section 6. I want to just do a quick read over. Uh, Aiden would have taught this, but I think it was like 60 billion weeks ago. So maybe we are forgetting. Uh, section 6. Just as God has appointed the elect to glory, so he has by the eternal and completely free purpose of his will foreordained all the means. Therefore, those who are elected being fallen in Adam are redeemed by Christ and effectually called to faith in Christ by his spirit, working at the appropriate time. They are justified, adopted, sanctified, and kept by his power through faith to salvation. None but the elect are redeemed by Christ or effectually called, justified, adopted, sanctified, and saved. Again, there we have another mention and the clear steps of the Ordo Salutis or the golden chain of salvation which we are essentially concluding today. Over the many weeks, we've gone over the different aspects of it, the effectual call, uh, saving faith, uh, justification, all of these things. And now we're reaching the end, the end of our salvation being glorification. And we're seeing here that we are preserved to that end, to that faithful end. And we read this uh, in Paul's writings, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. A beautiful truth, Philippians 1.6. And now I have a Spurgeon quote. Okay. When you go through a trial, the sovereignty of God is the pillow upon which you lay your head. So when we go through the storms and the floods and, and by our, even our own sin, all these things, we cannot feel the love of God as we should. We know it to be there but we're not feeling it, okay? Just as in my analogy of the mountain. I know the sun is on the other side, but my body is not letting me believe that it's going to be warm because, again, it's 38 degrees and we're at the top of a mountain. But we know that it's there. We know that it's coming. We know that relief is coming soon. So when we go through that, we can rest in the sovereignty of God and we can rest in the election of God. I have uh, listed here that election is the foundation of our salvation. Election is the foundation of our salvation. Election happened at the beginning, in eternity past, before we were saved. And election is bringing us all the way to the end. All the way to the end. Again, not by anything of our beauty or righteousness or anything like that but of Christ, of God's election. And now we can look here at the second sentence of this paragraph. It is based on the efficacy of the merit and intercession of Jesus Christ and union with him. The merit. And any time I use the word merit, I mean, I'm going to bring up the Roman system. And here we have it. What? No, this is it. I looked for maybe 20 minutes this morning to find a better chart. Yeah, yeah, this morning, yeah. <laughs> and there was nothing, no chart better than this one. But it works. And part of it, when we look at it and we're like, wow, that's very confusing. It's true. And it, and it shouldn't be that way. But here I can use, uh, oh, yes. I have a little laser pointer here. So the Roman system. It starts with the atonement here. All right, then we move into baptism. Baptism, which moves us into confirmation. And here we have the red line listing saved and unsaved, obviously. And something that this chart doesn't really tell us is that really any sin, any sin, brings us to this unsaved part. Essentially, really. It has purgatory here, but purgatory only happens to the people that aren't completely perfect, which would be everybody. Okay? Now, the way that they kind of try to combat this is by having something known as the treasury of merit. 
I hope you got your tin foil and your duct tape, wrap your head together so it doesn't explode. I mean, look at this. But the treasury of merit is this really big treasure chest in heaven, apparently. That when a saint dies, and they're, they're better than us, so they're perfect. And some of them are so perfect, they're extra perfect. And so when they die, they have extra merit. It's like, uh, you know, when you, when you pour a, a can of uh, pop into a drink, and it overflows, all that overflow is extra merit, which is then put into this treasure chest. And then the church doles out the treasure chest, all the goodies and toys from the treasure chest, to us plebeians through, the traditional way, was through indulgences, uh, the common phrase during the era of the Reformation by Tietzel, 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 whatever it is, was uh, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul out of purgatory springs. And again, this is the merit, which is only a system which can be devised because the Roman system requires additional works, additional merits to be given to the person. So that when they're up here in this region and they commit sins, they fall down and they get closer and closer to the unsaved area. Or if they commit a mortal sin, they're stuck forever, man. Sad, you know, sucks to suck, I guess, but you're down there forever. You're never making it back up here. This being glorification, the end point that we've been talking to, that talking about. What we persevere to, what God, from His side, preserves us to. Contrast that with the biblical view. Oops, there we go. This is much easier to understand. This is much easier. That... You can picture a cross here, you know, that we are atoned, we are saved, we are justified, and then, yes, we may, we, we, may, we may be doing quite well, we commit a sin. Oh, we're, we're doing well, we commit another sin. We're doing well, less sins, less sins, and we eventually reach that end stage. Again, this is what Brother Aiden has taught the last two weeks, so I won't be spending too much time on it, but it's important that as we look at it, the Roman system is not based on Christ's merit or on God preserving us, but our continually working, our continual appealing to the saints who are dead, appealing to Mary who is dead, doing all of these things, maintaining the sacraments in an attempt to maintain justification to make one better than they are. Whereas we would say, no, I'm, I'm no good. I'll, get, I'll slowly act more Christianly, and hopefully by the end of my life, I'm, I'm, looking, you know, I'm looking pretty good, hopefully. But I'm never going to get there, only when I die. That's why when uh, Dr. Cox, who was uh, my first mentor at Trinity College, when he passed away, and Dr. O'Farrell, uh, the president at the time, sent out an email letting everyone know because... He had had uh, cancer, and then it went away, and then it came back with a vengeance, and it, it took him that time. The way he introduced the news to us was Dr. Cox has graduated to glory. It is, it is a graduation. For the Roman system, there's no real change between the life which you should have here, perfect, and even extra merit, and then you, you go to heaven, well, it's just a one-to-one, because you earned it in that system. But for us, it is a graduation. We know Paul speaks well time and time again of looking forward to that, of being rid of his sin. He has a kind of existential crisis at the end of Philippians 1. I don't don't want to be here anymore because uh, it sucks being here. But it's better for you that I stay. So I'll stay. Plus I have work to do. So I'll I'll, I'll get to it with with a smile on my face as I'm getting beaten you know, every 20 minutes by a Roman uh, guard. But this is the system of the merit, that even our persevering is not our work. That's why I think there's a misconception generally of you know, a lot of people in the evangelical realm when they 
speak of the idea of persevering to the end. The idea of once saved, always saved. I like the language of God preserving me. It's a work that God does. It is a work that I do with Him, to be sure. But even that work is the Holy Spirit working within me. As Paul says, the good I do is not my own, but it is Christ in me. Now, let us look into paragraph 3. Any questions on paragraph 2? No? <clears throat> oh, I do have a quote from the book of Hebrews uh, while we're still briefly on... Oh, what am I doing? I, I'm not even like looking at my notes. No, we're still on paragraph 2. We're going back to there. Sorry about that. No, I know. This is... Listen, Dad, before you were here... It is, it's too much. The, the iPad's throwing me off. It's the technology. You should have seen it. I prayed and started, and my mic wasn't even on. I had to switch it out. The other one. It was no good. But let me read Hebrews 7. And this is why we are able to trust in the merits of Christ. Why and how. Hebrews 7, 26 and 27. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated, uh, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins, and then for the sins of the people. Because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Okay? So that's how we uh, crush the Roman Catholics with facts and logic, is with Romans 7, or Hebrews 7. Because they would say you need to, in the Mass, you need to re-sacrifice Christ. Okay? Re-sacrificium is the language of the Mass. We re-sacrifice Christ when the, when, in, in the Mass when the priest holds up the wafer, and he does, ooh, um, you know, sort of thing. That's him re-sacrificing, re-offering to God the Father the sacrifice of Christ, which is, I don't, I don't have to tell you, the blatant, blatant heresy. Because it was done once, for all, for all sins. And then we have the Spirit. The Spirit as a seal. We see this in the text of our confession, we see the abiding of His Spirit, the seed of God within them. The abiding of His Spirit, we can kind of say, which is the seed of God within the Christian. That the Spirit is a seal. If you would turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 is a wonderful chapter. Again, the idea of the economy of salvation largely comes from this, from this chapter of Ephesians 1. Of verses 1 through 14 tell us what each member of the Trinity does. The God the Father predestines, the Son sheds His blood and, and, and obtains an inheritance. Again, that word, the possession the purchased possession. And then in verses 13 and 14, we see the Holy Spirit. In Him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in Him, sealed in Christ, sealed in the Beloved. Again, we are accepted in the Beloved. We learned this from paragraph 1. We are sealed and placed into, hidden into Christ with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession. In other verses, the New Testament writers will speak of the Holy Spirit given as a seal, that we are stamped. And here, in this language of inheritance, we can remember, okay, what is the imagery in Revelation, the, uh, the opening chapters of Revelation after the letters? It's God the Father with the, with the seven seals, with the scroll which is closed up in seven seals. That's his will, his last testimony, as it were, his final will, which Christ is the one who executes. That's why there's no one else who can do it. Uh, John falls to his feet, he's weeping. The elder tells him, hey, stand up, look. He's, he's there. He is worthy to open the seals. He's worthy to execute judgment. And this in our inheritance, a final testimony of our Father, is that we receive the full blessings of Christ, a full glorification, and the seal, the stamp, 
is the Holy Spirit. So not only does he stamp our hearts and seal that, that no one may open it, that no one may remove our name from the book of life, nothing like that, but that to the end we have our inheritance, which is a better inheritance, right? In the theme of Hebrews, in the, in the theme of the book of Hebrews, that we have a better prophet, a better priest, a better king, a better rest, a better testimony, a better inheritance. Okay? Any questions on that? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Uh, he, so he sheds his blood, or um, another way you can think of this is that he purchases the thing for us. God says, these are my people. God the Father says, these are my people. They will have this. Christ purchases that, and the Holy Spirit seals it, ensures that we will get what is ours. Again, not on our own merits. Very important, not on our own merits, but on the merit of Christ. Okay? Okay? And then uh, our perseverance is a preservation from God. Again, this idea that God's election was at the beginning in eternity past, and it carries out. We are uh, declared righteous in justification because of God's election. We slowly but surely uh, grow in our faith because of God's election. We are ultimately, finally, preserved by God, and we persevere to the end by God's election. Okay, the doctrine of election should always be sung by the saints of God, because without it, I got nothing. Okay? And now we'll move into paragraph three, finally. Any questions here before we continue? Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got to treat them with this type of analogy that God chose us and you know, had nothing to do with us. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, this, this I would not classify as uh, elementary teaching. Uh, we maybe don't want to lead with, uh, let, me, let me instruct you carefully and minutely on this higher theology. No, the first thing we start with when we preach the gospel is be saved. Repent on Christ, be saved. God was through Christ reconciling the world back to himself, Second Corinthians 5 tells us. So we, as ambassadors of God, are begging you, be reconciled. That's what we present to people. You know, this... this I said that one time in Sunday school at a church. Yeah. 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 Well, you you can to be sure. Yeah, you can to be sure. And uh, we we will. Uh, we'll, Brother Aiden and Pastor Hotchkiss and I are, are kind of cooking up some different short classes again to kind of break up. You know, we we don't want to fall into a monotony with the London Baptist Confession. One of the things we're looking at doing is uh, um, teaching a you know couple weeks, maybe two or three weeks, on a class on on evangelism. How can we evangelize? to lost people. And then maybe even specifically, how do we evangelize to certain groups? Okay, how do we talk to members of the LGBTQ you know, community? How do we speak to Muslims? How do we, you know, Mormons maybe? All these different things. Uh, those are things that we are definitely looking into. Um, but yeah, we can definitely tell people that they're sinners. The Bible tells us to do that. Uh, where, where there was no knowledge of sin, there can be no repentance. Okay. So, good uh, question though. And now we're on to a paragraph three. They may fall into grievous sins and continue in them for a time due to the temptation of, Christ, of Satan and the world, the strength of corruption remaining in them, and the neglect of means of their preservation. In so doing, they incur God's displeasure and grievous Holy Spirit. Their graces and comforts become impaired, their hearts are hardened, and their consciences wounded. They hurt and scandalize others and bring temporary judgment on themselves. Nevertheless, they will renew their repentance and be preserved through faith in Christ Jesus to the end. He here is talking about those who are accepted in the beloved. Again, those who are 
Christians. They may fall away, and pretty dastardly fall away even. Okay, um, But when that happens, a myriad of different things can and may and, and will happen with the purpose of God bringing them back. And for this, I will quote another section of the confession. This one I taught about a bajillion D uh, weeks ago. Uh, chapter 5, section 5. Um, are you typing this, Mom? That's fine. Okay, well, because uh, the next, this next one. Yeah, yeah, if, yeah, you can just, you know, copy paste. Though. So here we have uh, chapter 5, section 5. The perfectly wise, righteous, and gracious, God, and gracious God often all allows his own children for a time to experience a variety of temptations and sinfulness of their own hearts. He does this to chastise them for their former sins or to make them aware of the hidden strength of the corruption and deceitfulness of their hearts so that they may be humbled. He also does this to lead them to a closer and more constant dependence on him to sustain them, to make them more cautious about all future circumstances that may lead to sin and for other just and holy purposes. So whatever happens to any of his elect happens by his appointment for his glory and for their good. Now, these are two possibly different things. Um, in chapter 5, I taught it mostly on uh, a you know, difficulty coming at us from more of a natural stance or, or um, God not necessarily punishing us. Uh, however, the true, it's still true that in paragraph 3, as we're looking at it here, Sorry, Mom. Um, here, God is chastising his children, okay? eventually bringing them back with the express purpose of bringing them back. One of the things which we see here is that spiritual warfare must start with personal holiness. Now, they may fall into grievous sins and continue in them for a time, Due to the temptation of Satan in the world, the strength of corruption remaining in them, and the neglect of means of their preservation. So again, yes, ma'am. Personal holiness. Yes, ma'am. That we must do as uh, again for the last two weeks, Brother Aiden has encouraged us, uh, and what uh, John Owen mentions and writes an entire book on: a mortification of sin in the life of the believer, we must be daily killing sin, or sin will kill us. That there is a sense of, yes, there is temptation of Satan in the world. The world and the devil, they do dastardly things all the time. But, as we looked at before, the lion's share of it falls at our own feet. The strength of corruption remaining in us and neglect of means of preservation. That for those two things, we, if we... Preservation. Or uh, st strength of corruption remaining in us uh, from the uh, confession. That for those two things, again, we, we can't necessarily control how tempted we are by the devil or how tempted we are by the world. Those, you know, those are always going to be there, pretty much. But what we can work on is killing the sin which remains in us and being holy, actively holy. First uh, Peter 2.24 speaks wonderfully, And he himself, meaning Christ, bore our sins in his body on the cross so that, okay, or for the purpose that, we may die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. That our, the spiritual warfare, our persevering, starts with us. There is a work that we have to do. Now, again, it is also a work which God does. Okay? And this leads into the next point. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. In so doing, they incur God's displeasure and grieve His Holy Spirit. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. No, that's, that's right, yeah. No, no, making sad is good, yeah. No, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, hashtag sad. Holy Spirit, hashtag sad. Yeah, that's what that says. Ephesians 4, verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. 
Again, bringing up this idea, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Um, elsewhere, I believe in a, one of Peter's epistles, or James, it's actually James uh, 4, 17, maybe? I didn't write it in my notes, but I believe in James 4, James does say, for the one who knows what the good thing is to do and doesn't do it, he sins. Okay? So there is sin by you know, action, by acting, and sin by omission. By not doing the thing we know is right. Okay? Was it James 4.17? Nice. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, that, I'm very proud of myself. I, I, did, I didn't think that was true. I know it was James 4. But, uh, so we don't want to actively do the wrong thing, obviously, but we don't also want to know what the right thing is to do, know how we can best serve God, feel the Holy Spirit, you know, nudging us along, hey, 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 well, do, the, do the good thing, do the right thing. Uh, for me, I always think of the Holy Spirit as uh, Stu Parsons' voice. Uh, he's one of my professors at uh, Trinity, and he's like the most holy guy that I know ever, and Aiden would probably say the same. He's like, I, I don't know how he doesn't levitate. He's like such a saint, it's crazy. But he has this wonderful kind of, yay, you good theologians, you, yeah. Uh, it's so encouraging. And so that for me, the Holy Spirit speaks in that voice. Um, and so we don't want the Holy Spirit to be nudging us to do a good thing, to do a holy and righteous act, and then we just kind of, you know, kick him in the face, you know. We, uh, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go do my own thing. That grieves the Holy Spirit. That makes him sad. Which, you know, there is, I mean, you know, that's not a wrong phrase. You know, that is right. I just, I thought it was funny when you said it. But yeah, don't. I yes, ma'am. You, you hear all the Yeah. You know, um, you, you don't ever hear it, that, well, that starts with you. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, we, it doesn't only end with you. Sure. You can't respond. You don't yeah. Choose a response. Yeah. But that it starts with you. Yeah. There's like, a, there's like a growing trend which has been going for many years of the like, like, not today, Satan. You know, like, don't you, don't you do that to me, Satan. Why don't you say not today to your own flesh first? Mm -hmm. Okay. Get your own household in order before you go, you know, trying to talk to Satan, which we're not even, we're not even supposed to do that. Right? We're, we're not supposed to do that. Um, Christ does that on our behalf. Right? He sends his angels to combat other, you know, to combat demons on our behalf. Right? We're not supposed to challenge Satan. That's like the dumbest thing. We're like literally told not to do that. Um, but yeah, it starts with us. Right? Because... When we fall, when we fall into sin, it's not like we can shift the blame onto Satan. Like he's doing what Satan does, right? He's doing what he's supposed to. Do. The world is broken; it's doing what it does. The sin, the, the 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 guilt for that lays with us. So we should be working on ourselves uh, through Christ, always through Christ, through the Holy Spirit, and listening and obeying those things. Okay, uh, Psalm fifty-one will be our next text, because we can see, in so doing, but when we fall into grievous sins, and when we continue in them for a time, we do incur God's displeasure and grievous Holy Spirit. The next thing that, we, that happens is uh, our grace and comforts become impaired. Or, in large parts and at certain times, they become removed. God does remove His blessings. For a time. Very scary thing. But Psalm 51 uh, tells us that. That uh, as um, David is crying out to God and confessing his sin for killing uh, Uriah, the, the, the Hittite, and stealing his wife Bathsheba, he says, you know, that he feels this great. Wait. Verse eleven. Do not cast away from. Uh, do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. And this is interesting, also, that he prays this because that's exactly what happened to his predecessor, as the king of Israel. It's exactly what happened to Saul. Don't cast me out. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. 
Don't take your Holy Spirit and all the blessings which come with that. Don't take those things from me. Any question on that? That one's pretty easy. Not too much. And I'm just using Psalm 51 because it's like the easiest way to kind of look at that. Um, also Psalm 32 for the next section which our confession tells us happens as a result of falling into grievous sin is the hardening of heart and a conscience which is wounded. Which is different a uh, hardening of heart. The one before, with Psalm 51? A removal of grace. Okay. Is Psalm 51. And then Psalm 32 is for the hardening of heart. Another psalm from David, as he does all the time. And this one is also kind of a you know, loss of the grace as well. But picking up in verse 3. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. But this is uh, important. When we, when we don't confess our sins, when we try to just live with them, which we should never do. We should never become roommates with sin in our life. Now, when this happens, it, there is, you know, there may not be physical torment, but there is certainly spiritual. And I'd find in my own life there is accompanying physical torment, which is heavy on us and a, a wounded conscience that it, God's hand is heavy upon us. Our vitality is drained. And then our body wastes away while we're silent. And then there is a next a temporary judgment which comes to the people of God as they fall into grievous sins. They hurt and scandalize others and bring temporary judgment on themselves. Now this temporary judgment can look like a myriad of different things. But I will use again the example of David. 2 Samuel 12, 14. However, because by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born to you shall surely die. This was uh, on account of David's sin with uh, Bathsheba and uh, the murder of Uriah the Hittite, that the child that was born conceived in that union, did die. And Nathan makes it very clear. He says, he goes up to David, he's, you know, David confesses to everything. This is shortly after Nathan's, you know, proclamation of you are the man. You are the man who uh, stole a, a precious sheep when you had thousands already, and you killed a man. You're the man. You are that man. Yeah, I didn't watch VeggieTales. So. Uh, and so this is after David confesses and says, "This I, I did this. How could I have done this? I did this. Please forgive me. Nathan then says, uh, you, know, you are accepted. God does forgive you. However, because by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born to you shall surely die. Again, it's not to say that every Christian who falls into grievous sin, uh, their firstborn is going to die. <laughs> That's obviously not what, I'm, not what I'm saying, not what the Bible teaches. But there is oftentimes a temporary judgment. Again, as a way for God to spurn his children to come back. Because they are always brought back. Nevertheless, they will renew their repentance and be preserved through faith in Christ Jesus to the end. Again, 
a beautiful thing when the confession speaks of certainty. They will renew their repentance. And the example here is uh, the fallen restoration of Peter. Peter denies the Lord three times after he gets told, hey, by the Lord, by the Lord Christ, hey, you're going to do this thing. Peter's like, what are you talking about? I'm going to the death with you. And Jesus says, no, you're, you're going to do this thing. Uh, I'm, I'm going to pray for you that it doesn't happen and that you don't get sifted like wheat. He ends up getting sifted like wheat. He ends up falling. Uh, but then he's restored by the Lord himself. He's brought back. 2 Timothy 2.13 will be our final verse before uh, we get to closing. 2 Timothy 2.13 If we are faithless, he remains faithful. Why? For he cannot deny himself. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Again, Paragraph 1 is so important. We are hidden away with Christ. We are in the Beloved, purchased by the Beloved. And here I have on the screen that golden chain, which Brother Aiden and I have been talking about for many weeks now. And we are really at this end now. We've gone through... Election, predestination, the effectual call, justification. In between, justification and glorification is that sanctification, okay, which takes time. And then glorified, glorification is the very end, which we only reach when we die and we're in heaven. Okay? Any questions about anything? No? Okay. Uh, next week, we'll be looking at the assurance of grace, the assurance of salvation. Uh, so no questions like that came up today, but I'm sure we'll have some for next week. There's a fly flying around. Goodness me. All right. I do, of course, have one uh, Spurgeon quote to end, which is, you know, you're shocked. Well, I had a Spurgeon quote before you came back in. And it's this. And this is uh, comforting to me. And again, uh, Chapter 5, section 5, that God oftentimes does lead his children into all sorts of trials and tribulations, that they would grow, that they would know the strength of corruption remaining, and ultimately for his glory. I tie that very similarly with this chapter. And I remember this verse very fondly. The Lord's mercy often rides to the door of our hearts on the black horse of affliction. Jesus uses the whole range of our experience to wean us from earth, and woo us to heaven. Let us pray. Lord God, uh, we thank you for this time that you've blessed us with. We thank you for your word that you've blessed us with. Uh, We pray for our brothers and sisters who are not able to be with us now, uh, that you would hold them close to your heart, that you would heal those who are ill, that you would minister to them all, and minister to us also, Lord, that we would grow in holiness and devotion, uh, a real love for you. We would look forward to our glorification, when we will no longer sin, uh, when we will be with the Lord himself, when, Lord, wean us off of this earth and woo us towards the blessed heaven. Uh, We pray for the service coming up. We pray for Pastor Hotchkiss as he prepares to deliver your word and boldly and well. Uh, Let it be planted deep within our hearts that we would grow, and as we leave this place, uh, we would desire uh, to make our king known in Tarpon Springs and to all of our lives. So every aspect of our life, we would glorify you. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Do you know that quote? Which quote? The last one? Mm-hmm.